So it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker of the symposium, uh, Professor Eric Mazur from Harvard University. Uh, actually, Eric is doubly famous. He's uh, famous as a researcher, which is why we've invited him here this time. But he's also famous as an educator. I think he holds a dual position, as a matter of fact, as Harvard, both in the education faculty and in the physics faculty. And perhaps we'll see his educational skills because he says he's going to put us to work. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, but I didn't plan this with him, so I don't know. Um, Eric is a Bolansky Professor of Physics and Applied Physics and the Area of Dean of Applied Physics in Harvard University. He came to Harvard in 1982 after obtaining his PhD at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Actually, it was during his postdoc that he made his first trip to Ottawa. I invited him, I know for sure. I think maybe in 1981. We were just discussing this a bit. I'm not quite sure. 82, maybe 82. Okay. But uh, anyway, it's the first time, and it's not, it's not only the second time he's been here. Other times in between as well. <clears throat> so Eric's research group uses ultra-short laser pulses to study ultra-fast dynamics and physical systems and to create extremely extreme non-equilibrium uh, conditions in matter. Uh, his many advances that are associated with his work. Uh, let me mention that uh, one of them is micro-machining of waveguides inside photonic structures. Such structures can be used to fabricate integrated photonic devices and circuits. And so that's one thing. Uh, also, he's used tightly focused laser beams to interact with biological samples. I don't imagine you're going to talk about biology, but it, just so you know what he's done. He's interacting with biological samples. That is, it allows nanosurgery on the scale of uh, organelles inside small cells. So he's got a number of awards. Uh, I'll mention a few. He was awarded the Young uh, Presidential Young Investor Investigator Award in 1988. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society. He's awarded the Ex Award of Excellence in Education by the Consul Council of Scientific Society Presidents. He was selected in 2006 as one of 75 most outstanding American physicists. He was awarded the Ether Hoffman Beller Medal by the Optical Society of America, and he's a corresponding member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science. So it's welcome to invite, it's great to welcome you back to Ottawa. Thank you, Paul, for that very kind uh, introduction and, it's, and for the invitation to come back here. It's really wonderful to be here. So I'm going to talk about none of the topics that Paul mentioned. I'm going to talk about old physics, the index of refraction, and in particular about making that index of refraction zero and the type of optics you have when the index of refraction is zero. And I'm going to start, I know I'm the last speaker of the day, you must all be tired, I am tired. So I'm going to keep this really, really basic. But as Paul mentioned, my work is not only in optics, it's also in education. And I thought that for this occasion, I'd combine the two together. So we'll make this pedagogical, and you will have to work. The door is closed, it's too late to leave right now. <laughs> So I want to start with that picture in the background. I love that picture. Um, for one, it was taken by a photographer who was part of my family, an uncle. He recently passed away. He was one of the founders of Magnum Photos. But the, the main reason I like this picture is that it shows the manuscript for the book Optics by Newton, which he published in 1704, and on top of it, is the prism that Newton used to look at refraction. In fact, it's open, the manuscript is open on the page describing refraction. Now, curiously, Newton did not introduce the index of refraction. He described the process of refraction, and he, had the, he has this table uh, right there under the, under the prism that shows angles of incidence versus angles of refraction 
but he never took the ratio or the ratio of the signs. That was done actually about 100 years later in 1804 by Thomas Young, who for the first time introduced the index of refraction N. I don't know why he chose the letter N, but uh, well, maybe it's the second letter in the word index. I have no idea. But that letter N is the subject of this last talk of the day for you today. So I'll talk about the index. Where does it come from? What determines the index? And then we'll venture into a regime that has not very much been explored yet. What happens when the value of the index goes to zero? And since I'm an experimentalist, I wouldn't just be telling you all these things if I didn't have some experiments to uh, show you. So let's start with the index. Where does it come from? I'm going to start really, really basic at sort of the undergraduate level. It comes from the wave equation, which follows from the Maxwell's equation, which contains um, this product of mu, the magnetic susceptibility, and epsilon, the dielectric uh, constant, which is not a constant. It depends on the, on the frequency. And if you substitute a sinusoidally oscillating wave into this equation, you get a relationship between the frequency omega and the wave vector k. And again, this product of epsilon and mu pops up there in the denominator, the square root of it. And that square root is defined as the index of refraction. Now, in general, epsilon and mu depend on the frequency um, and on the material, of course. And therefore, the index of refraction also is a function of frequency. Where does that frequency dependence come from and what does it look like in, in the sort of very general terms in the optical regime? So it's determined by epsilon and it's determined by mu. What do epsilon and mu actually tell you? They tell you how a material reacts to an external electric and magnetic field. So it's in a sense embodies the response of a material to an external uh, field. Let's first look at epsilon, and then we'll look at mu. Uh, I, I, I'd like to start with uh, a little illustration from Purcell's book. I don't know how many of you know Purcell's book on, uh, on electromagnetic waves, on electrodynamics. It's a beautiful book. And when he introduces epsilon, he basically talks about a medium between two capacitor plates. And as you charge the capacitor plates, you polarize the atoms inside the medium that is in between those two plates. And as you polarize those atoms, you attenuate the field between the plates. And in a sense, epsilon is a measure of the attenuation of this electric field. So how does an electric field get attenuated? Well, well let's consider atoms. And for the purpose of this talk, we're going to separate the charges that are in the material into three different classes. The free electrons, if there are any, and the conductors. Of course, you wouldn't put that between the plates of a capacitor because that would be a short circuit. But let's keep our discussion general. So you have free electrons. You have the valence electrons, which are the most loosely bound electrons around atoms. And then you have everything else, which, you know, the inner shells of electrons and the uh, ion, the, the nucleus, which will consider one unit, namely the ionic core. If you have a bound, just to refresh your memory, if you have a bound electric charge, consider just, a, let's say, an electron on a spring. If you apply an oscillating electromagnetic field and you look at the response as a function of frequency, imagine first a really, really high frequency, way above the resonance frequency of that electron on the spring. Nothing happens because the frequency is way too fast. It's like taking a swing and shaking it way above its resonance frequency. You're not going to get much amplitude. And if there's not much amplitude, there's no attenuation. So for really high frequency, epsilon is equal to 1 right here. What about low frequency? Well, you know, if you take a swing and move it very, very slowly, you get a, a certain amplitude. So that means the electron is going to get displaced from its equilibrium position and therefore attenuate the electric field and therefore contribute to epsilon, which is why at zero frequency or low frequency, epsilon is larger than one. As you approach resonance in between those two extremes, um, the amplitude will grow very large. The phase uh, 
of the swing will be out of phase with the driving force, and therefore the amplitude can actually increase and the attenuation can increase, but then it very rapidly decreases as it goes to higher frequency. That's sort of the dispersive wiggle that you see in the real part of epsilon, which I've denoted here, epsilon prime. Of course, when you are at resonance, there's a lot of dissipation. The amplitude is at its maximum. And therefore, there's also an imaginary contribution to epsilon, which is that uh, dotted line. Now, that's sort of an imaginary model of one electron on one spring in a real material, such as the materials that we have around us. Differently situated electrons will have different resonance frequencies. So there'll be many of these dispersive wiggles all over the electromagnetic frequency spectrum. But if you plot for some sort of a hypothetical material, epsilon, as a function of frequency over a very large frequency range, all the way from, let's say, radio waves to X-ray, you see a plateau-like um, uh, dependence as shown here. At really, really high frequency on the far right end, none of the charges that we've shown can keep up and therefore the material is essentially a vacuum, and epsilon is one. At lower frequency, typically around the visible, the valence electrons slosh back and forth and contribute to attenuation of the electric field, and therefore epsilon goes up. At still lower frequencies, the much more sluggish ionic cores go back and forth, further attenuating the electric field, giving rise to the next plateau. And then if you have dipoles that can reorient themselves, not in a solid, obviously, but in a in a liquid, you can have very, very significant attenuation. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but now you can buy little capacitors about the size of a quarter that have a one farad capacitance. One farad, okay? It used to be that you had a, to build a capacitor the size you know, of, a, of a suitcase in order to get one farad. Well, that's because there's these very high dielectric constant uh, dipolar liquids that are in there. So in reality, of course, there'll be much more structure for any real material, but most materials have an epsilon that depends on frequency in these plateau-like regions uh, that go from high epsilon at low, and therefore high N at low frequency, and low N at high frequency. That statement should surprise you, because we always learn <clears throat> in our introductory courses that the index goes up with frequency and not down. And actually, both statements are correct. Does anybody see why? This is not a very difficult question. I'm going to ask you way more difficult questions later on. <laughs> hmm? It depends very much on where you are in this curve. If you look if you look between these dispersive wiggles, it actually does go up, right? It goes up here and then up, 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 and then everywhere where there's an absorption, there's anomalous dispersion and it goes down, and it goes down more than it goes up between the absorption. So, so locally, the index of refraction, when you're away from resonances, goes up, as we learn, but over a large frequency region, it actually goes uh, down. Now, there's also mu. We don't talk very much about mu in most optics courses for a reason that will become clear very soon. And there are also magnetic resonances. Magnetism is much more difficult than, than, uh, uh, than uh, static electricity. But you know there are magnetic resonances that have a similar type of shape as a, as a Lorentz oscillator. And if you look at the contributions to mu over a large frequency range, you also see a step-like distribution. Why? Well, at really high frequency, nothing can keep up and it's one. And then the electrons start to contribute at lower frequency. And then the nuclear spin starts to contribute. And if you have magnetic domains at very low frequency, that can cause much more attenuation. However, there's a big difference between mu and, eps and epsilon. Epsilon, I plotted from, uh, I think, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 4 radians per second, the magnetic resonances take place at significantly four orders of magnitude lower frequency. So by the time we are in the infrared part of the spectrum, we're already at 1. And therefore, for us interested in, in optics, mu is equal to 1. And therefore, typically, 
in most optics text, mu is not considered because you know, n is simply the square root of epsilon rather than epsilon mu. Okay, so we've seen that epsilon and mu can be complex. They have a real part and an imaginary part. And the real part can even be negative. I've not shown that there. I took my slide out. I wasn't thinking while I was preparing my slides earlier today. But if the resonance is strong enough that dispersive wiggle can actually push the value of epsilon and mu both to uh, negative values. And certainly if you take the Drude model, if you take free electrons, you know, then the epsilon actually crosses zero and definitely becomes negative below the plasma frequency, which is why light can propagate inside a metal below the plasma frequency. Okay, so the real parts can be negative. Whenever you have a square root, you put something negative in between, things get tricky. So the first question I'd like to answer, and this is gonna take me about 15 minutes, or it's gonna take you about 15 minutes because I'm gonna have you answer this question, is what happens when the real part of epsilon and or the real part of mu becomes negative? Well, we can write both of them as a complex quantity, an amplitude, epsilon, and an amplitude mu times e to the i, and then a phase angle, and we'll represent those on a unit circle. So for, for now, we assume that the amplitude is one. That's, of course, not a, a correct assumption, but at least we can conceptually think about it that way. So here I'm showing two possible values for mu and epsilon. On the horizontal axis, we put the real parts of mu and epsilon, and on the vertical axis, we put the imaginary part. So what is the index? Well, the index is the square root of the product of the two. We can pull the exponential out. So we have e to the i. I realize this is a little bit small, so let's see if I can actually uh, enlarge that. So it's e to the i theta plus phi divided by two. And under the square root is the square root of the absolute uh, value of epsilon and mu. So what does that look like? Well, the square root of the amplitudes is still one because the amplitudes are one. But e to the i theta plus phi divided by two is the line that bisects epsilon and mu. So here's my first question to you. Is this the only possible value of n that I've shown there on the unit circle? So I want you to think about that, not talk to your neighbor. And then I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds or so to think about that, and then I want you to vote by placing your hand on your chest with the number of fingers representing the choice you make. If, when I call the vote, you do not put your hand on your chest, I'm gonna come to you with this microphone, <laughs> and I'm gonna put the microphone right in your face, and you're gonna have to tell the whole room what your answer is. By the way, I tell that to my students too, so as soon as I say that, quickly they put their hand. So think about this for a moment. Who wants more time to think? Wave like this at me, discreetly. Wow, you're all fast. Okay, so since nobody wants to think anymore, you must all have made up your mind. And by the way, don't, don't, don't get worried. I'm, I'm not keeping a record here. The way you vote is not gonna affect anything. Your salary is not gonna change, I mean, so, but you must pick a choice, remember that, right? So at the count of three, one, two, three, everybody. Okay, I see twos, I see threes, I see fours, any ones? Four. Okay, so there are all answers there. There's no agreement whatsoever. Here we have people, all professionals in optics. <laughs> huh? You need the index of refraction for whatever you do in optics, and there's no agreement. So turn to or find a neighbor near you who has a different answer and see if you can convince your, that person that your answer is correct and his or her answer is wrong. You get one minute, go ahead. Find somebody who has a different answer. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, well, I, I see some people who stopped talking. I, I hope you managed to convince your neighbor. So let's see if people have changed their, their minds. So at the count of three, you have to vote again. Indicate what you now believe to be the right answer. If you have not changed your mind, then you vote the same thing again. So at the count of three, one, two, and three. Okay, without changing the number of fingers, raise your hand so that people can see. Go ahead, everybody at the same time, look around. Twos. Fours, threes, oh my God. <laughs> so let's look. You know, there is another root, right? Because I can add two pi to the exponent, right? I'm gonna add two pi to the exponent and after taking the square root, I get not two pi, but I get pi when I take the, the exponential outside of the uh, square root. So there is another root which lies in the negative half plane. Now, before you start to rejoice, however, let's see what that means, right? I mean, what does the index mean? The index determines the relationship between k, the wave vector, and the frequency, or lambda, as I have it there. And when, the, when you have a, an n in the negative half plane, or, or yeah, in the negative half plane, like shown here, the real part is negative. So if the real part is negative, then you can see that the real part of k becomes negative, right? Because if this is negative, then that is negative. So that means e to the i k minus omega t, that, that k, the real part of k, becomes negative, and you get e to the, sorry, I should talk about the imaginary part. I, I'm tired too, it's not just you. The imaginary part, gets negative. Sorry, that's what I should have talked about, not the real part. We'll talk about the real part later. The imaginary part becomes negative, so this k double prime becomes negative. If the k double prime becomes negative, then with i in front of it, it becomes minus k double prime x, and k double prime is negative, so that means what? Amplification. It gets stronger. Well, if we have a medium, I mean, in a laser you can get amplification if you have inversion, but in a passive medium it's impossible, right? So you can't have, so for a passive material, the index must lie in the positive half plane. It cannot lie in the negative half plane. So the correct answer is number one, of which I saw very, very few. <laughs> but you know what, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be generous because I did not specify passive material. I didn't say, so if you chose two, that was correct as well. And you know, if both one and two are correct, then it depends, it's also correct. <laughs> And if you're a lawyer, then you know that you can not only add two pi, but also four pi, and then six pi, so there are really many more uh, <laughs> solutions. All right, I won't be as generous on the next question, okay? But in the process of doing this, we learned something really interesting. We learned that to find the index for a passive material, what you do is you draw the line that bisects epsilon and mu, and then you take the value on the positive half plane. That's the prescription. Okay, notice that we have not yet answered the question that I was after. What happens when one of these two real parts is negative? Notice that for certain values of epsilon and mu, we can get a negative real n, right? Like here, for example. Right? Mu is shown there, epsilon n. So now we have a, a negative real n. So my next question is, must both the real part of epsilon and the real part of mu be negative in order to get a negative index, a negative real index? One, yes. Two, no. At the count of three. One, two, and three. Okay, I see mostly twos here, which is indeed the correct answer so I won't have you talk because there are not enough ones there. Because look at what it shows there, right? I mean, if you have, wait, pardon me, let me go back, I went too far. If you have mu like that in the first quadrant and epsilon in the third quadrant, then n still lies in the second quadrant. However, and this is the important point, you need a magnetic response in order to get a negative index, right? If mu is stuck at one, you cannot get a negative index.
Okay, now we'll deal with that problem later. What would happen when the real part of n is negative? We looked a moment ago at the imaginary part. Let's look now at the real part. If the real part is negative, then k prime is negative. If k prime is negative, that means that the phase velocity is in the opposite direction, which is weird. Of course, the, this is what it would look like. Okay, here's a, uh, a COMSOL simulation of a wave getting into a medium. Look at that. goes in. Let's follow a red phase front. It comes into this negative index material. There it hits the front, jumps to the back, travels towards the front, jumps to the back, and comes out. It's as if it infinitely fast transfers to the other end of the sample, travels back, and then out. Isn't that weird? Does that mean that some kind of signal can go you know, superluminal, faster than the speed of light? That term, by the way, physicists have tried to eradicate that for over 100 years, and it keeps popping up left and, uh, left and right. Let's first establish the following, right? Does this violate causality? But let's first establish the following. The pointing vector cannot switch sign. It still goes towards the front. K goes from right to left in a in a negative index material, but the pointing vector still is determined by the directions of the electric and magnetic field, and that is not affected. Now, the first person to think about all of this was actually, was actually Sommerfeld, in, uh, just after um, Einstein had published uh, his theory of special relativity, because people already knew then that you could have group velocities or phase velocities that would exceed the speed of light. So people were wondering, does that, this is an important point, does this violate Einstein's principle of uh, relativity? And Léon Briouin, who was then a PhD student, worked uh, in München with Sommerfeld and worked on these problems and beautifully showed how a signal, an electromagnetic signal, always travels at the speed of light C in vacuum. Through a material or not, it's always the speed of light C in vacuum. And they published some papers in the 1910s, 20s, or early in the 20th century. And when Briouin, later in his life, was uh, in uh, New York, he spent part of his time as an applied mathematician at Harvard and then had different jobs at, I think, the labs and, and other places, he started realizing that people were again talking about superluminal signal propagation. And he published this book, which I think everybody should read, everybody in optics, Wave Propagation and Group Velocity, where he republishes some of the original articles with Sommerfeld. Just Google B1 and Wave Propagation, and you'll find the book. I don't know if this is legal or not, but uh, the whole book is, 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 uh, is online. And the first thing he does is actually he makes a really good argument, right? The wave inside the material is a superposition of two electric fields. The external electric field from the wave that is incident plus the electric field that is due to the polarization of the atoms in the material. And if you consider an atom on the far side, it cannot react to a wave that hasn't arrived there yet. So there cannot be a reaction from an atom before the wave has actually gotten there. But then he also proves this mathematically. And in those days, you couldn't just you know, simulate it on a computer. You had to work out these integrations. And they take something like 10, 12, 13 pages. Um, it's quite a tedious uh, read. Um, but he shows that the signal, he analytically shows that the signal always travels at the speed of light c. So, I can animate it for you. The problem with the animation I showed you the first time was it was for a CW wave. We need to see what happens when you have a, a wave with a heavy side function that arrives and travels towards the material. So let's see what happens. And uh, look, it, it takes a while for those counter propagating negative waves to develop. It's not that parts of this side that the signal jumps from there to there and then back. It takes quite a while before that actually develops. 
So let's plot this a little bit differently. I'm going to take each and every frame of this little movie and take one row of pixels and put it on a plot with distance on the horizontal and between the dashed lines is the material and time in femtoseconds on the vertical. So you can see that the phase fronts arrive at the speed of light C in vacuum. And then you can see that it actually takes a while for the reverse propagation to develop. Let me get an annoying arrow out of the way here. You can actually see that the group velocity is about a quarter of the speed of light in vacuum. It's not bigger, right, because we have distance versus time, so you have to flip the, the plot to think about speed. But look carefully. This right here, there's some stuff there. And in fact, if you blow it up, you can see that there are high frequency pr precursors. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Because the time when a wave is switched on, at that time you get lots of spread in frequencies. And the highest frequencies are going to experience the lowest index of refraction. It's like, the, it's like vacuum. So the blue frequencies are going to get through before the red frequencies. You see it blue beautifully here. But now look at this. This is so beautiful. The signal itself always travels at the speed of light C. That very front always travels at the speed of light C in vacuum, material or not. Doesn't travel faster. It doesn't travel more slowly. It travels exactly at the speed of light C. B1 showed this 100 years ago. This is a way of seeing it. I think it's something that is worth uh, uh, you know, realizing. So look at now my finger here at the front. Notice that it just keeps moving through. You can see it in this little animation. If you look at the front, it just went through always at the same speed. OK, so now that we've done this, we can classify materials. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to classify non-lossy materials, which means that I'm not going to talk about materials where the imaginary part is substantially non-zero. Those are not interesting because light doesn't propagate through them. So that means I only have to look at the real part of epsilon and mu, and I'm going to put those on the two axes there. So in the regime that you have a positive epsilon and a positive mu, you have dielectrics. When epsilon, and then you have the k vector pointing in the same direction as the pointing vector. In the next quadrant, with a negative epsilon but a positive mu, you have metals, in which case you have no propagation, but you have an evanescent uh, wave. In the opposite quadrant of dielectrics, you have negative index material. The k points in the opposite direction of s. And then in the fourth quadrant, you have what is called a magnetic plasma, and you have an evanescent uh, wave again. Now, dielectrics, as we know, are limited by diffraction. In metals, you have no propagation. Negative index create opportunity to do a lot of interesting things. However, if we look at materials, they are not in that quadrant. They're all stuck there. Why? because mu is equal to one. We're essentially stuck there when we use natural materials. So what happens on the axis? Notice that that dashed line crosses the axis. So wherever you cross an axis, epsilon is zero. And if epsilon is zero on the vertical axis, then n is equal to zero. So first of all, what, what would happen if n were equal to zero? Would the frequency of the light go to zero? Would the phase velocity become infinite? Would it be both of the above? Or neither of the above? I'm sorry, to, I'm, I'm mean to make you work at the end of the day like this. But I think it's much more fun to think about these things than just to listen passively. So which of those four choices would you choose? At the count of three. One, two, and three. I have to look what is right. OK. OK, I see lots of twos, but I see some threes and fours, too. So let's see what happens. Um, the wave equation, right? So if epsilon is 0, let's look at the wave equation there at the top. If epsilon is 0, then that term drops out. 
Wow. That's amazing, right? Because now the wave equation is a very different equation. What kind of equation is it? A Laplace equation, exactly. Where do you find the Laplace equation in electromagnetics? In electrostatics. So all of a sudden, the solution of electrostatics become true even though we have a wave. And in fact, if n is zero, then k is equal to zero, so the spatial dependence drops out. And we, we sort of recognize electrostatics. The electric field is the same everywhere. It varies in time at terahertz frequencies, but it's the same, just as if we had electrostatics. And what about the phase velocity? Well, the phase velocity is omega over k, so if, one over, if n goes to zero, then one over n goes to infinity, so the phase velocity becomes infinite. Still doesn't, of course, violate causality, because the same arguments that I used hold, but the phase velocity becomes infinite which is the correct answer. The frequency, of course, is determined by the external source and can't change. So what does it look like? Well, if you have an ordinary material with an index larger than one, the phase fronts are more closely together in the material. If you go below one, they get spaced out more. And if you go to n equals zero, the field is completely uniform. It still oscillates up and down at the same frequency as the external field, but it's uniform. And in a negative case, which you already saw, it's counter-propagating. So this would be a, a you know, zero index material. It was a uniform. We've, in the simulation shown, still accounted for some losses, which is why there's a slight decay in the intensity there. So what can we do with uniform phase? Well, imagine we have a waveguide, and we put a zero index piece in there. The phase, as the wave arrives in the zero index material, is completely uniform. If we were to put something in there, the phase would just, the light wave would just go all around it and come out just as if it was not there. Perfect cloaking. Of course, only at the zero index frequency, and you know, this is not something practical, but kind of interesting. Also, you could overcome diffraction limits. You could take a wave guide and overcome the necessity of slowly tapering down the diameter. Light is very fussy. If you take it from a waveguide of a certain width and squeeze the diameter, you lose intensity. You can't couple the light in. With a zero index material, you essentially get tunneling of the light uh, over very short distances. So to get, let's say, light from a macro or mesoscopic scale to a nanoscale, a zero index material would be great because it could permit you to couple very fast. The question is how? Well, one way would be to have epsilon go to zero, but epsilon and mu not only affect the index, they also, also affect the reflectivity. The reflectivity is given by this ratio of impedances, and the impedance is the square root of mu over epsilon. In most books, mu is taken one, and therefore that equation looks a little bit different from what you might have seen, but this is what it is for non-zero mu and epsilon. So if epsilon goes to zero, then z goes to infinite, infinity, and then the reflection goes to one, which is quite a problem because that means you can't get the light in. This is, by the way, a zero index material that you encounter every day, probably early in the morning. What am I talking about? A mirror, exactly. At the plasma frequency, epsilon is zero, but you can't get light into it, which is why we use it as a mirror. OK, so what if we have mu go to zero? If mu goes to zero, n goes to zero, z goes to zero. If z goes to zero, r goes to minus one, which means you get, again, 100% reflection, but now with a 180-degree with phase shift, so it's still not good. So that means that neither epsilon zero nor mu epsilon zero can give you a zero index material in which you can couple light. The only way to keep the impedance finite is to have both epsilon and mu go to zero at the same time in such a way as to keep that ratio finite. But that requires a magnetic response. And natural materials don't have a magnetic response. So that means we need to engineer a magnetic response. We can't do that with a bulk material because we can't change the atoms. However, we can make a metamaterial that consists of units of different types of material. And then in 
this kind of composite material, this kind of metamaterial, the properties do not derive from the constituent atoms, but from the constituent units and the polarization, if you want, of those constituent units. So we're going to start with an array of dielectric rods. Why dielectrics? Because they have the least dissipation of energy. They're, they're the least lossy. And imagine that you make an array of rods in such a way that the spacing between the rods is commensurate with the wavelengths of the light in this material as shown here schematically. I should really have drawn the electric field a little bit more steep in the silicon and in the air in between them, but I was lazy when I made this slide. Now, this electromagnetic wave will cause an electric response. And if we look at one pillar, we see that the electric field on one side, on the left side, points down, and on the right side, it points up. So it will induce a downward pointing polarization on one side and upward pointing polarization on the other, which is in a sense like a little current loop, a quadrupole moment. And that has a magnetic field associated with it, and therefore uh, it will have a magnetic response due to this uh, electric polarization. So what are the adjustable parameters that we have in the design? Well, in what I've shown here, we have the diameter of the rods, we have the spacing of the rods, and we, we cannot really change the index of the rods themselves because we're pretty much stuck with, um, with silicon if we want to use state-of-the-art fabrication facilities, but we can put some polymer in between. This was our first attempt. I'll show you how we simplified later. And after some simulation and a lot of calculations which I'm shoving under the rug here, we found that with these values given here, a diameter uh, or a radius of 200 nanometers, a separation of a pitch, if you want, of 700 nanometers, and an, an SU8, which is a polymer in between the rods, we essentially got both the real epsilon and the real mu to cross at the same time. Not exactly at the same time, because you also have to take into account the imaginary parts, which are not shown here. But the result is a pretty linear dispersion that goes from positive, low positive values at lower frequencies uh, towards negative values at higher, at higher uh, wavelengths and which crosses zero around, what is it, 1570 or so. And notice that the uh, impedance is pretty close to one, which means you should be able to easily couple light uh, into it. This is what it would look like. It's different from the, the uh, animation I showed you before, because now you can see that the electric field, the phase of the field in the pillars is different from that around it. But that's actually true in the material too, right? If you are very, very close to an atom, the electric field will be very, very different. And in a field too, in a sense, epsilon and mu are effective values. They're not, it's not completely uniform. When you're very, very close to an atom, the electric field can be enormous when you're close to, let's say, the nucleus or, or an electron. And in a sense, in this material, the pillars are the atoms. But since the wavelength is so much larger than the spacing between the pillars, the situation is not that different from having a material made from atoms, except that we don't have that many. OK, so this is at n equals 0. Um, here we are at uh, a slightly lower wavelengths, shorter wavelengths, and therefore positive values of n. And here we're at negative values. I'm going to run you very quickly through how we make it. How do we make a, an array of rods? We can't, so on an SOI wafer, we, in the device layer, we, we have uh, pillars. Since the pillars are finite, we put two mirrors around them so that it looks like, a, uh, uh, due to the images, like an infinite array. We s then send in, put in polymer in between and send in the light, as I just showed. So here's, here you can see the different fabrication steps. There are the pillars. We put the bottom mirror, gold, that gets evaporated between the pillars. There's also some that gets on top. Then we put the polymer on there, and finally the top uh, mirror. How are we going to show that the index is zero? Well, how did Newton do it? He used the prism. So let's make a little prism and look at refraction of light. So we'll start with a prism and then bring in a waveguide so we can couple light into the prism. 
And if the index is zero, then the index of refraction, sorry, the angle of refraction should be zero, that alpha that you see there. So let's make that a little bit smaller so that we can sh I can show you how we measure that. We put a semicircular slab of SU8 so that we can look at the scattering. Here's the actual device. So you can see the prism there in the inset. If you look at it, that's what it looks like. You can see the top mirror there. And uh, here's an overview. The prism is there at the center. This is the waveguide that brings in the light. This is the slab where we can measure the scattering. And we have a calibration wavelengths around. If you look very carefully, we have another replica of the prism there um, so that we can measure the pitch and the, uh, the radius. We make many of these devices varying the pitch and the radius in case our simulations are not exactly correct. And now we're going to measure that angle alpha as a function of incident uh, wavelengths. So here's a picture under the microscope. And uh, this is to show you where the semicircular slab and the incident um, uh, waveguide is. And as you can see, at this particular frequency, 1570, we got a zero degree angle of refraction. So we can take these little pictures, bend them straight, put them on a plot, and then change the wavelengths. When we go to shorter wavelengths, we see a positive angle and therefore a positive index of refraction. When we go to larger wavelengths, we see negative index of refraction. This is the simulation uh, and the uh, actual measurement. So how do we find the index? Because the index is not the angle. Well, Snell's law, so that's not very difficult here. The retrieved values for measured and, and simulated, you can see a clear crossing uh, at zero. If you want more detail, much more than I can provide here, uh, I refer you to our publication. So let me use the last few minutes to tell you where we've gone since then. So much has happened, I, I, did, I had difficulty choosing what I was gonna tell you, but I won't, I won't uh, give you too many details here. The first thing is that the mirrors create a lot of losses, omic losses. So we decided, let's just remove the mirrors. What happens if you remove the mirrors? If you remove the mirrors, you replace ohmic losses with radiative losses. Because remember, if you have something that has zero index, then it emits light off of any surface perpendicular to that surface because the critical angle is zero. So if you remove the mirror, it just radiates perpendicular to. But it turns out that those radiative losses are about the same order of magnitude as the ohmic losses. So we repeated the whole experiment, and, and now the fabrication is really simple because it's simply an air hole array rather than you know polymer in between uh, the mirrors and so and so on. And then Arad, who's here in the audience, came up with a brilliant little idea. Let's simplify it further and just take a single uh, row out of this material. Then we have a 1D, one-dimensional, zero index metamaterial waveguide. And if we have a waveguide, of course that will be leaky because it will leak at the left and the right, but we can put a photonic band gap material there to prevent radiation. So what happens when you have a zero index waveguide, or let's say low index waveguide? If the wave goes in, it gets very long. In fact, it gets stretched beyond the diffraction limit so you can actually directly, with a microscope and your own eyes, see the wavelengths. Now, of course, you can't do it with a traveling wave, but if you send in two pulses, you can observe the standing wave pattern. So we built uh, this waveguide with a photonic band gap structure. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is what a simulation shows you should see when you see this, this pattern. And here's the first measurement, which actually, to my knowledge, is the first observation of the effective wavelengths of light inside a material. So now you can change the wavelengths and measure the distance between nodes. And from the distance between nodes, you know half the wavelengths. The index follows simply from the ratio of the free space wavelengths and the effective wavelengths. And you retrieve your index straight from there, uh, except that you don't get the sign because there's the absolute uh, value. So again, another publication that gives more details than I can. So the last minute, I think there are very interesting applications ahead. 
because the index of refraction appears in many places, both in the denominator and in the numerator. Things blow up or things go to zero. Just give an example. The Einstein A and B coefficients depend on n and 1 over n. So that means that spontaneous emission should be suppressed. Stimulated emission should be enhanced. Fantastic platform for quantum optics, provided we get the losses under control. You may remember this equation from nonlinear optics. If the n there goes to zero in the denominator, that nonlinear optical term blows up. Of course, we know it won't really blow up. This was done in a perturbative approach, and it's no longer perturbative when the denominator goes to zero, but you can see that interesting things will happen in nonlinear optics there. And it's more than just the intensity. It's also related to what we call phase matching. So let's look at four-wave mixing. Two pump photons in, you come in with a signal, and an idler is generated. This process has to satisfy energy conservation, which is already shown on the left, but also momentum conservation, which means that the k vectors, and these are vectors, not scalars, need to add up to zero. And in general, that is not possible in a collinear uh, arrangement. Now, we have linear dispersion, so that may happen. But what happens as we slide through that n equals zero point? If S, P, and I are all positive, we have what is shown at the bottom there. But if we slide I, O, and so the idler comes out in the same direction as the pump and the signal. But if we put the idler right at zero, something interesting happens. Because now that wave vector will be zero. The phase will be the same everywhere. And the idler should come off in any direction perpendicular to the surface. So you should see both forward and backward idler, which you can't see in the positive index regime. What happens in the negative index regime? So we slide it even further now. The I goes all the way there. Then K points in the opposite direction. Which direction does the idler come out now? Well, remember, in the negative index re uh, regime, K points in the opposite direction, but the pointing vector is still in the positive direction. So in that case, we should again have only the idler in the forward direction. So in Bob's group, um, uh, Arad and co-workers did uh, some measurements. So here we are in the positive index regime. You can see that S and P, this is the, the signal, this is the pump. The pump is a pulsed laser. The signal is a CW seed. Um, so this is the input. And if we look at the signal in both the backward reflected direction as well as the forward direction, you see that there is no idler in the backward regime, but there is an idler in the forward one, as we would expect. So now we're going to slide this over so that the frequency of the idler gets near 0. And what do you see? You see the idler appear in the backward direction, which is not possible in either a positive or negative index uh, material. In fact, if you plot the intensity of the idler as a function of frequency, you see a sharp peak there where n equals 0 occurs. Well, it's late. I'm separating you from dinner or, or, or drinks, and I think I've spoken here long enough, so I want to end by, first of all, thanking the organizers for inviting me, but then the many people whose work I've been discussing here, uh, in particular uh, uh, a former postdoc, Yang Li, and two former graduate students, Phil Munoz and Arad Reshef, who is now here, and who is Justin Gagnon, has done these wonderful measurements on the uh, four-wave mixing in uh, low-index materials. Thank you very much. I have two questions. So if, if you go to the second slide, I think where you have, you show the refractive index as a function of wavelength, please. The, the second slide. The second slide, okay. It, it, well. Basically when you show the resonance is the atomic, uh, molecular, and the other. Uh, yeah, it's not quite the second yes. slide. Yeah, so this one? Yes. So, uh, yeah, so if, if you notice, you, there's always, the refractive index goes 
up and then it goes down and then it goes back to, uh, at least for the last one, it goes up, it goes below one a little bit and then it goes. What prevents it from keeping, like, going down and below zero? What prevents it, that? It, it, it actually does. I, I took out the slide showing that, I'm so sorry, but I, okay. I, uh, in some materials which have very strong resonances, it can actually go below zero. In some dielectric materials, I think it's silicon nitride, what is it, Murad, can you remind me? Huh? Silicon carbide, for example. The, the, the wiggle is so strong that it actually shoots all the way all negative. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have but we're still, we're, we're, that, that would not constitute a material in which you can easily couple light because mu is equal to one. And therefore, there, there'd be a huge impedance mismatch with whatever other medium you're using. Well, there might be other ways to achieve that, uh, like using meta materials. But uh, anyway, that's. Uh, uh, but uh, the other question, which I kind of had a discussion with Orad and uh, the student on it also, is: Does that actually uh, count as a uh, well, in, in the final results when you have backward forward mixing? Does that actually account as as a quantum forward mixing process? Because I, I get this example. If you take the whole thing, put it in a black box, you have two photons going in and then one forward, one backward. There is um, there's no conservation of momentum per se. So you have some momentum transferred to the medium. That's not an elastic process. It's an inelastic process. So is that a quantum forward mixing process? And if not, what, what is it? I don't know what you mean by quantum forward mixing, quantum, but you're... Quantum, it means two photons in, two photons out. Like two photons in, interact, and immediately you get two photons out. Yeah. But here you have energy transfer to the medium, and then it transfer back somehow. So it's not, and, and some of the energy remains in the medium. Yes. So it's, it's not an elastic process. It's not like a Kerr effect. It's more some other kind of... Uh, Right. I don't know if you've read Mansouri Poor's recent papers on momentum transfer to medium. It's a very interesting paper. I, I, I highly recommend it. And I, he had not really thought about zero index and negative index material. So I asked him that precise question. And um, I'm working on it, but I'm not completely clear on it. It's certainly, we're certainly not in the quantum regime. I mean, there are many photons coming out. Uh, in, in the experiment that, that, that you've shown here. But I, 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 I just want to call, clarify, like two, for example, when you draw two arrows up, two arrows down into a virtual state, that's what I mean by a quantum process. Let's say other kind of processes which involve absorption by material, like a Raman process or something, you go, some, like the electron ends up in a, another steady state or basically some energy transfer to the medium. That's, that's not necessarily a quantum process, and the, the reason I ask that is that affects the speed of the process. If it's not a quantum okay. process per se, it will not be a fast process. Okay. So. I, th I think part of, part of this is semantics, uh, in my opinion, and uh, there's certainly no real level at the top. It's, it's, a, it's a virtual level, and in that respect, it is a, a quantum process. But I suggest that we talk about this in more detail later. Yeah, so uh, coincidentally, uh, we've been thinking about some of these uh, questions in, related to attosecond transient absorption spectroscopy. And so there you have a very short pulse which excites your medium, and the response of the medium afterwards uh, in free induction decay is exactly out of phase with the incident radiation. And so in the frequency domain, it puts a hole in the transmitted spectrum, that's just absorption. Um, now, when you explained it microscopically with the response of a resonance system, um, I think you were not quite right. And so below resonance in a, in a driven oscillator, the response is in phase with the drive, driving force. Yes. Above resonance is out of phase. It, that's but right. But on resonance, yes. it's pi by two. Yeah, exactly. So, and so I absolutely true. So I could ask you to, maybe I have four choices of where the extra <laughs> pi by two He's comes from. He's getting even. <laughs> but uh, it was Sir Peter Knight who explained this to me, and he thought it was in the Feynman lectures um, where you have a sheet of such a resonant oscillators in the far field at a, at a point, say, on axis. If you integrate over all of these, uh, you have a different phase shift depending on the path length. And so this picks up the extra 
factor pi over two. And so it's actually a macroscopic effect that goes yes. into Maxwell's equations based on the microscopic response. Yeah, I mean, you're totally right. I, I misspoke. It starts to get out of phase as you approach. I mean, think about a, 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 a you can think about this conceptually, imagine a swing, shaking it back, back and forth. It will be always completely out of phase with the, with the driving force. Same is true with uh, you know, the Lorentz oscillator model. So zero, pi over two at resonance, and then pi at high frequency. I misspoke. So, fantastic talk, but I think everybody knows that already. Uh, you show three resonances there. The second and the third go up and then come down and overshoot. The first one does not have that characteristic shape, but you said that the first one is a uh, molecular orientation. And it's very you heavily damped. Could you draw it that way, and could you explain to us why you don't get that behavior? Because it's extremely heavily damped by, by the viscous nature of, of these, the realignment of the, of the molecules in this liquid. Okay, That's the only, the only example I know of in which you can get that. Thank you.